Welcome to the module Thir Developing Understanding of Third Grade Fractions. In this module, we will be looking at the fraction standards for third grade, as well as strategies for teaching each of these standards. I wanted to start out by just identifying the major work of the grade for third grade. Uh, these are just the major standards or the major topics of the grade. And then what are the just additional or supporting standards? Uh, the major standards are those that we need to focus the most attention on. Uh, these will be hev most heavily tested as well on the EOG. Uh, the supporting or the additional standards are just standards that we do need to address, we do need to teach, but when it comes to prioritizing our time or deciding on um, for remediation or if we realize you know, our pacing's off and we need to decide what to do, our major focus does need to be on this left-hand column of um, the major work. The major work that we're discussing today are those standards related to fractions, so developing the understanding of fractions. Um, the standards that we're going to be addressing are on this screenshot right here. I'm not going to read this for today, but I do want to highlight a couple points. NF1 just means to develop an understanding of fractions, as well as the symbolic notation for fractions. Uh, this is, In third grade, it's the first time that students will be seeing the symbols of one-half or one-fourth or three-fourths. Uh, prior to this, in first and second grade, students did equally partition shapes into halves or thirds, but they never actually saw the symbolic notation. Um, NF2 just relates to uh, understanding fractions on a number line. Uh, and then NF3 focuses on comparing fractions and equivalent fractions. I do want to point out that NF3 does not mean uh, that we need to multiply the numerator and denominator by, um, by the same number, but it does mean that we are just building models and showing that any time that two numbers or two fractions are on the same place on a number line, they have the same value. Or any time that um, two squares have the same amount shaded, that's the same value. Those are equivalent. Before we get into strategies for instruction related to fractions, I did want to just read a quick caution. Uh, fractions are one of the most abstract and challenging concepts for elementary students, and students often give up trying to understand the concept, and they will resort to memorizing rules. Uh, this is especially dangerous because then they will, students will often get confused between the rules, and this will lead to difficulties within fractions concepts. Difficulties with fractions will lead to difficulties with decimals, percentages, ratios, measurement, um, and future fractions concepts. This means that if students struggle with fractions in elementary school, they will struggle with pretty much every other thing that they encounter in middle school and high school. In order to help with these difficulties, we really have to help students truly learn fractions. In order to do this, we will first need to teach a deep understanding of the concept through concrete models and through drawings. And then later, when students have that understanding, then we can introduce those skills or those procedures or those rules. We'll talk a little bit about this later on. The very first experiences that we do with students in third grade really need to be embedded in a context or a real life situation. If we're using real things like food or money, things that have meaning to students, uh, this will help eliminate any misunderstandings and mistakes that students typically make. Um, even when you're asking a student, if you give a student a piece of paper and you ask them to fold it into fifths, a lot of times if it doesn't work out right for the student, they might end up with sixths. They might rip off a sixth and say, okay, now I have a fifth. But if you give the student a real-life context of brownies, they're not going to throw away a whole sixth of a brownie pan. They're going to make sure that everybody gets a fair share and there's no leftovers. So right away at the beginning of um, introducing fractions to third grade students, I would start by doing a task like this. And there is a similar task to this in the Meaningful Math tasks. Um, this task says Jamie and Scott shared a pan of brownies. Uh, show all the different ways that they could equally share a pan of brownies between two people. So essentially, you're, you're breaking the brownies into two halves. Um, this will give student, you a really good idea of what students understand about fractions, because if students are creating two different shares that are not equal, you will understand, you will know that students don't have that strong understanding. Um, the other thing is students might only be able to share it one way, but if students have a strong understanding of fractions, they would be able to create equal shares in different ways by drawing diagonal lines or um, breaking the pan up differently. 
I might spend one day on this activity and then focus on a couple different strategies for um, sharing those that pan of brownies. On the next day, then I might introduce uh, a couple more quantities to work with. So this now says that there's four more friends, so they have six shares. And it says what fraction of the pan would each person receive now? And then it asks you, which share is larger? Did I get a larger share when I was sharing with six people, when I got one-sixth? Or did I get a larger share when I got one-half? Um, this really starts to help students understand that the larger the denominator, uh, the smaller the share, which is a really tough concept for students. So the some of the topics that we're going to focus on at the beginning of our fractions unit is that fair shares must all be the same size. And you'll see this at the bottom left. A lot of students will try to partition a circle um, incorrectly, and it ends up creating, um, I guess, unfair shares or not equally partitioned um, shares. The other concept that we want to touch upon, and this is still related to standard NF1, is that equal shares might not have the same shape but they need to have the same area or the same measure. So equal shares just means that there are two shares or three shares or four shares, they have the same measure or the same area. Um, students probably won't understand that at the beginning of this uh, unit, but hopefully by the end of the unit, you will have done enough real world tasks with them where they can start to draw on this understanding. And there are one or two meaningful math tasks related to this concept that you can pull from. Uh, I just wanted to address a couple different fraction models that stu students could be exposed to at the third grade level. Uh, one fraction model that you will notice on the slide that is not here is a set model. That just means a set of objects. The reason set models are not here is because we don't use them until fourth grade. That's when they're first introduced. And that just means you know, 12 counters or 12 Smarties. So what is one third of the 12 Smarties? We would not be doing that in third grade. The models that we focus on in third grade are number lines and then area models, like a square area or a rectangular or circular, circular area. So let's look at a couple models that we could use with third grade students. Circle models bar or rectangular models, uh, geoboards, and this is a great tool because this still focuses on that area model and it also is a tool that students used in first and second grade when they were equally partitioning shapes, so they're already familiar with the tool. Paper folding, uh, pattern blocks, uh, grid paper or dot paper, and again that dot paper, that would be really good as you're using your geoboard because then it moves you from a concrete model to a more of a drawing, uh, which is useful because students might not always have access to a geoboard. And the grid paper is a really useful tool because it's one that they will have for the EOG. Um, again, paper, which this refers more to like a sentence strip or a, tape, a piece of um, register tape from a uh, cash, cash register. Cuisinier rods. And then the last one is a number line, and we'll be talking about this one a little bit later. Uh, like I said before, this is the first time students will be seeing the symbolic notation for fractions. Uh, so we really want to focus on what do those numbers mean. Every single time you talk about the symbolic notation for a fraction, you want to use this type of language. Um, so what does that numerator mean? It's the counting number. It tells us how many um, parts that we, we have in our set, um, how many parts that have been counted. Um, or the bottom number, the denominator, tells us um, that we are looking, what size part we are looking at. So what is being counted, or what size is being counted. So after I do a couple activities like that brownie activity that I uh, did on a previous slide, um, I would move into focusing on some models. And uh, this is one that I would do with students. Now this slide is a little bit misleading. In third grade, we are only focusing on the fractions of halves, thirds, fourths, sixths, and eighths. So there are some circle models here that we do not focus on. Let me say that once more. In third grade, we only focus on halves, thirds, fourths, sixths, and eighths. In fourth grade, then they end up focusing on fifths, tenths, and hundredths, in addition to the, the fractions that we focus on in third grade. So I would probably give students circular models only the ones that are applicable to third grade, obviously. I would have them color-coded like they are in the picture. I would have them already cut up and put in a baggie. Then I would ask each of my students to pull out, close their eyes and just pull out one piece. I would show them what a whole circle looks like and I would have them guess what fraction of the whole circle they are holding.
Then after they guess, then I would have the students see if they could figure out what fraction they're actually holding by either building it, they could pull out more pieces, um, do whatever they need to to figure out what fraction of that hole they're holding. Then we would have that conversation about how they, how they solved that problem. And then the next part of this task, I would ask, I would challenge students to see how many different holes they could build using like size pieces or how many different circles they could build using like size pieces and that's what you see right here. Um, there is a sheet to go with this to accompany this and I will put that at the end of the presentation. Um, what they end up realizing is that um, one, one whole circle can be built in different ways. This will also later tie into that standard related to equivalent fractions, that there's more than one way to represent one. Um, if you have a number line in your classroom that has fractions on it, uh, or that even doesn't have fractions on it, below the number one, after you do this task, you could write the other ways to represent one. Two halves, three thirds, four fourths, uh, six sixths, to show that any point on that number line um, if there's more than one number on that point, that those all those numbers have the same value. So essentially, all these quantities or all these fractions really have the same value of one. And I would probably just list all of those numbers right below that number one on your number line. Um, after you do this activity, then later on, as you're working with equivalent fractions, you could do another activity similar where you're seeing all the different ways you can build one half. So after we start focusing on um, what are fractions and how to build fractions, we are going to also make sure that we address comparing fractions. A couple big ideas related to comparing fractions is that um, two fractions can be compared only when they talk about the same whole. So if you said to students, um, I ate one-fourth of a large pizza and Jenny ate one-fourth of a small pizza, who ate more? They really wouldn't know because they don't really know how big each pizza is. You can only compare two things when they're talking about the same whole. Um, the other concept related to this is decomposing a shape into more equal shares creates smaller shares. And again, that's a hard concept for students, but I'll show you an activity that you can use to address this. Um, so, kind of building off that, that concept that we just talked about, students will often think that fractions with larger denominators are bigger in size. So to help dispel this misconception, you would take those circle models again and have students take one piece of each circle, and then they would just order the pieces from largest to smallest. After they've done that, then you would want them to go back and label the pieces using fractions. And again, uh, we wouldn't be using fifths, tenths, or twelfths. We would just be using the other fractions. When students do this, they will end up noticing that the denominators are actually getting bigger, but the pieces are getting smaller. So then we would have the conversation with students, so why is this happening? Well, because it takes 12 of those little pieces to build a hole, but it only takes two of those big pieces to build a hole. <clears throat> Another way to compare fractions is by making fraction fringe. Now the teacher might want to make this or the students can make this. Uh, if I was doing this activity, I would probably only focus on um, even numbers because those are easier to cut. Uh, but that's, that's up to the teacher. And then you could use this when you're looking at equivalent fractions or when you're comparing fractions. Uh, by the end of the unit, Besides using visual models to compare fractions, uh, students will hopefully start moving to um, just attending to the fractions themselves and compare them. Uh, so for example, if two fractions have the same numerator, students could say, okay, well, the one on the left has three pieces and the one on the right has three pieces. So which pieces are bigger, the eighths or the fourths? Okay, I know the fourths are bigger, so that fraction is larger. The other way that students could do this is by using benchmark numbers on the, on the number line. A benchmark number is just a friendly number that is easy to visualize, like 0, 1 half, or 1. Um, so I might say, okay, well, 3 fourths is pretty close to 1, and 3 eighths is pretty close to 0. So I would say that 3 fourths is larger. The other thing that students should be able to do with this is when two denominators are the same, they should be able to say, okay, well, I know we're working with eighths, so which is bigger, when I have two of those eighths or when I have five of those eighths?
So again, starting with visual models and then moving to, by the end, just attending to those fractions and reasoning about those fractions. Um, one big piece that I just mentioned a few minutes ago was making sure that you have a number line um, on your wall in your classroom when you're talking about fractions. Uh, I would probably do some sort of clothesline and have just paper clips with um, index cards with the fractions on them. And then this would help um, so that students can manipulate it. I would start by placing those benchmark numbers up there, numbers that are easy to visualize, and use those to help me place the other numbers. Um, this is a great activity. This is from the K-5 Math Teaching Resources website. This is in our, re our resource guide, and it looks at all different types of um, number lines. The students would get a series of cards, and they would have to figure out which, which number line would be easiest to place those cards. Uh, this could be a partner activity where one partner has the number lines on the left, and one partner has the number lines on the right and then the students could figure out which place is most appropriate for placing those cards. Um, one note about this fraction that I wanted to point out, nowhere in third grade do students technically work with mixed numbers. They do, however, work with improper fractions. We don't, we don't introduce the term improper fractions in third grade. I believe that term is introduced in fourth grade, but we do realize that when we're putting thirds on the number line, that we can put one third, two thirds, three thirds, four thirds, five thirds, and we just keep uh, measuring out thirds and counting up thirds. Um, and this one would end up being four of those thirds. Um, so that's pretty much the extent of improper fractions in third grade. Um, then students are going to be looking at equivalent fractions in third grade. Um, equivalent fractions, this focuses only on building those fractions using models or drawings. Uh, so for example, um, this idea right here of figuring out the different ways to name this drawing. Um, so you could call it two-eighths, or you could call it one-fourth. Uh, a good activity to highlight equivalent fractions is to have students uh, fold a paper in half and color one half and then have them fold it back in half to the way they originally folded it and fold it in half again uh, and then open it up and figure out what part is shaded now. Uh, now they would probably say that two-fourths are shaded. So I would write one half on the board, I would write two-fourths on the board, and I would say, wait a second boys and girls, um, did you color something extra or did you take anything away? And they would say no, and we would say, okay, so this is the same amount that you originally colored when you colored one half. So we would say, okay, so two-fourths is equivalent or equal to one half. Um, I would also say, hey, look at this. You doubled the total number of pieces. So originally you had two pieces. Now you doubled it and you had four pieces. And when you created that extra fold, you ended up also doubling the number of pieces that were colored. Um, so it looks like whatever you did to the bottom, you did to the top, which made it stay the same amount. And I would do this a couple more times. So refold it the way you had, fold it back again the way you had, and then make a new fold, fold it in half again. And that would end up creating four eighths, and then finally eight sixteenths. And I would just have that same conversation over and over again. Did you color anything extra? Did you take anything away? So what did you do? Oh, well, you doubled the number of pieces, which it also doubled the pieces that were colored. This next slide here talks about how we could reason about equivalences but using a number line. I just wanted to touch really quick on the last slide, the paper folding slide. As you do that slide, you can also refer back to your classroom number line and you can remind students that any time that a quantity or a fraction falls um, on the same place as another fraction, any time there's two numbers that fall on the same point in the number line, they are equivalent. So as we're looking at all the different ways on that last number line or that last slide to build one half, we could add all of those fractions to our number line, you know, punch a hole at the bottom of uh, the index card for that first fraction, hang another fraction right below it, and say all of these one half, one, two fourths, four eighths, four eight sixteenths, those are all different ways to build one half, and those are all the same place on the number line, so they're all equivalent. Here's another activity talking about equivalences using the number line. This is an activity from illustrativemathematics.org. Uh, the activities on this website or on this uh, resource link are very similar to our meaningful math tasks. So I wanted to just read this one. It, again, could be done as a meaningful math task. The teacher could have students grapple with it. The students could do a math talk, and then the teachers could do some 
some reasoning or some teaching around it. So the activity says John and Charlie plan to run together. They argue about how, how far to run. Charlie says, I run three-sixths of a mile each day. John says, I can only run one half of a mile. So then the students would have to explain why it's silly for them to argue, and they would be encouraged to draw a picture or some sort of visual to support their reasoning. After the students reason and do a math talk, then the teacher can introduce some models. Um, this is one example of a model that the teacher could show of why it's silly to argue. This is a bar model. And then this is another example that the teacher could draw. Uh, the reason I really like this resource, this website, Illustrative Mathematics, is because it gives the teachers all of these visuals and all of these teaching points that they could use uh, to teach this task after they've given it to the students to grapple with it. So it is very much similar to our meaningful math tasks. The last thing I really wanted to just touch upon is the fact that we really need to focus on reasoning in math. And I thought that this was a good uh, article or a good little comic of, of why it's so important to focus on reasoning. Uh, so Calvin is saying, you know, I think math is a, I don't think math is a science. I think it's a religion. A religion? Yeah, all these equations are like miracles. You take two numbers, and when you add them up, they magically become a new number. No one can say how it happens. You either believe it or you don't. This whole book is full of things that have to be accepted on faith. It's a religion, and in the public schools, no less. Call a lawyer. As a math atheist, I should be excused from this. So that's just kind of an example of what students think when they uh, experience math, typically, and we want to really undo this thinking. We want to really focus on the why it makes sense, to really help students be able to reason through something. So even if they don't remember a procedure or remember a rule, they can use their reasoning and understanding to solve a problem. Thank you so much for participating in today's module. Have a great day.